Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7 as we continue our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Today we're going to look at what's called the Golden Rule. You know it as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's not the way it is in the Bible. but That's the way we have learned it. But in Matthew chapter 7, if you look at verse 12, Jesus actually said, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. There's another text in Luke 6, 31. And uh, this is Luke's rendering of the golden rule. As you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. So I don't know who came up with the handle, the golden rule, but it, it fits pretty good, doesn't it? There are worldly variations to the golden rule. Like uh, he who has the gold makes the rules. Or do unto others before they can do it unto you. Now we like Jesus' version better, amen? And that's what we're going to look at today. That word therefore is not a detached statement, but has a connection with what has preceded this. Our Lord is still dealing with the subject of judging others. Now this chapter started, judge not, lest you be judged. Therefore, in the matter of judgment, let this be the rule. Treat others the way that you want them to treat you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? All the great textbooks on ethics and morality, social relationships, it can all be reduced to that one great principle we call the golden rule. I don't know about you, I'm glad the, this round of elections is over. Maybe we'll get a break from all the mudslinging commercials. Uh, these folks running for office, they're not treating one another like they want to be treated, are they? There's a lot of mudslinging going on, so I, I'm hoping we'll get a little break from that for a while. But uh, by the way, uh, in advance, let me say I approve this message. <laughs> and uh, I hope you will too before it's over with. Practically everybody knows the golden rule. Even those who were not raised in church, have read their Bible, they know the golden rule. Some seem to think that this is the basis for getting into heaven. I've asked people, say, well, are you say, do, you, do you know if you died today you'd go to heaven? They say, yes. And I say, why do you believe that? They say, well, because I keep the golden rule. Because I try to treat others right. You'd be surprised how many people believe that. That, that is the way to heaven. And uh, a lot of them are surprised to find out that that's not the way to heaven. Now you give them a good person test and you find out they're not keeping the golden rule after all. So let's look at this today. The golden rule. And uh, see what the Lord Jesus meant by this statement. If you want to take notes, first of all, I want you to note the treatment that is desired here. Jesus speaks of how we desire others to treat us. How do you want to be treated? Let me, let me share four thoughts with you concerning that. I think you'd agree with me on this. First of all, we want to be treated lovingly, right? Psychiatrists tell us that one of the needs of every person is to be loved, to feel loved. Husbands and wives want to feel loved by their spouse. Children want to feel loved by their parents. It's a need we all have. Now, I've never met anybody who did not want to be loved. Have you? Now, I've met some that were hard to love. Some are kind of unlovable, aren't they? Don't nudge the person next to you. We're not going there. But yeah, think about this. God loved us. When we were unlovable, what does the Bible say? That God commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. There's nothing all that lovable about us, but God chose to love us. 
And the love of God is to be shed abroad in our hearts. To be loving toward others. I, I ran across this the other day. One of the saddest things I've ever read. This was a will written in 1935 by a Mr. Donahoe. Here's what he said. Unto my two daughters, Frances and Denise, by reason of their attitude toward a doting father, I leave the sum of one dollar each and a father's curse. May their lives be fraught with misery, unhappiness, and sorrow. May their death be soon and of a lingering, malignant, torturous nature. May their souls rest in hell and suffer the torment of the condemned for eternity. I think he's a little upset with his daughters, don't you? I don't know what in the world they had done. That's awful, isn't it? For somebody to have such thoughts about, especially in your own family. Nobody wants to be hated. We all want to be loved. We want people to be our friends not our enemies. Secondly, we want to be treated respectfully. We want people to like us, to treat us with respect. We, we don't want people thinking badly about us or looking down upon us or, or trying to avoid us. Sometimes I thank God for caller ID. There are some people we want to avoid talking to. You know how it is, the phone rings and somebody says, don't answer it. It's a preacher. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> but we do that. We, we all know people we really don't want to be around, but we hate to think we're that person that others just do not wish to be around. We want people to like us and treat us with respect. But if we want that, do we give that? Are we respectful towards others? How do you treat the waitress at the diner? We had one couple here. She was a waitress. And uh, she started dating this fella. They'd go out to eat. He would just be so rude and disrespectful to the waitress. And uh, she knew what that was like because she'd been on the other end of that. And uh, she had a hard time getting him over that. that. It's not the way you treat people, right? It's not how you want to be treated. The Bible says, 1 Peter 3, 8 through 9, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil. Thirdly, I think we want to be treated honestly. We hate people being dishonest with us. We hate when people spread gossip about us. You know what happens to liars when they die? They lie still. <laughs> Amen. Some of them probably end up in hell and be lying about why they're there. So I don't deserve to be here. We like to be around people who cannot be honest with us. Let me give you a verse on that. Romans chapter 13, verses 12 and 13. There it says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting, drunkenness, nor in strife and envying. A lot of people are just pretenders. They're, they're hypocrites. Reminds me of a fellow who was looking for a job and he answered a help wanted ad. And it was at the, city, at the city zoo. He went and applied for it. They said, well, what's happened is our gorilla died. And it was a favorite attraction here. The, the kids just loved that gorilla. And so we decided to skin the gorilla, and we're looking for somebody who will wear the gorilla suit and pretend to be the gorilla in the monkey cage. The guy said, man, that's just perfect for me. I mean, I, I can nail this. I need this job. So they hired him. He would go into the monkey cage, and 
He put on quite a show. I mean, he, he could do all kinds of shenanigans. He liked to get on the tire swing and just swing back and forth, just get as high as he could on that tire swing. Well, one day, at the height of the swing, the rope broke. And he and the tire sailed over the fence into the next den, which was the lion's den. The lion was resting in the shade, and he saw this coming in, so he gets up and moves towards this man. And the guy starts screaming. He says, help, help, the lion's going to kill me. Somebody help me. The lion leaped on him and said, shut up, man, you're going to get us both fired. <laughs> now, kids, that's a parable. <laughs> so that didn't really happen. Uh, you know what a parable is? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What's the meaning? Well, we don't want people being dishonest with us, do we? But are we dishonest with others? Number four, we want to be treated compassionately. When you mess up, how do you want others to treat you? Do you want them to be criticizing you and, and putting you down? Or do you want them to be forgiving and, and understanding and compassionate towards you? We don't want people kicking us while we're down, do we? But do we ever do that to others? Instead of reaching down to help them up, are we very cross and cruel to them? You know, the Bible says in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, He said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, are you spiritual? Ye which are spiritual, Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or compassion, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So if you practice the golden rule, you're going to need to be spiritual and filled with the Holy Ghost. Years ago, two teenagers who had a long history of crime, robbed a YMCA in New York City. A young man happened to be there, and before they left, the teens beat this young man savagely with a blackjack, left him for dead. The police came, and they found the body of Don Tippett. But Don was still alive. He lived, but one eye was so badly damaged that it could not be saved. The two teens were arrested and brought to trial. Their past records assured that they're going to spend a long time in prison. But Don Tippett did an amazing thing. He wanted to help these young men, so he requested that the judge parole them into his charge. He wanted to give them another chance. So the judge agreed to this. One of the boys blew the opportunity got into trouble again and was sent to prison. The other boy, however, took advantage of this opportunity. He went to college. He went on to medical school. He became an eye surgeon. A reporter writing this story said of the surgeon's accomplishments, he said, I wonder if he ever performed one of those delicate eye operations without thinking of Don Tippett and how he lost one eye because of these teenagers and their actions. This young man decided to devote his life to saving eyes after taking one. Can we be a Don Tippett? Can we be that forgiving, that compassionate? So I want you to note the treatment that is displayed here. Knowing how we want to be treated by others. How do we treat others? Do even so to them. That's the key part of this. If you want others to treat you lovingly, respectfully, honestly, compassionately, then treat them that way. We call this reciprocation, don't we? It goes back to another principle, you reap what you sow. 
If you sow unkindness, if you sow bitterness, unforgiveness, what's going to come back to you? Same thing you're sowing. It's going to come back. I've had people say, well, Brother West, I don't have any friends. No, nobody is friendly toward me. We know the Bible says, Proverbs 18, 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Are you friendly toward others? Do you reach out to others as a friend? Somebody will come to church and say, well, nobody spoke to me at that church. Well, did you speak to anybody? I've had people leave our church. They said, well, we just could not connect with anybody there. Did you try? You know, I've noticed something. Friendly, outgoing people don't have any trouble making friends. Amen. If you're having trouble making friends, maybe it's because you're not that friendly. Amen. We want people to treat us better than we treat them. That's the point. Everyone agrees that this principle is wise, the best way to live. But why don't we practice it more? See, natural man does not implement the golden rule because his whole attitude toward God and righteousness is all wrong. That's the problem. If we're to treat others the way we want to be treated, two thoughts I want to share with you here. Understand our treatment should involve unselfish action. We're not trying to manipulate other people. We're being straightforward and honest in how we deal with them, and we've got the right motive behind this. We're not trying to, to get our way with somebody else. The objective is not what we can get out of them. That's selfish. You do these things because it's just right. It's just the right thing to do to treat others this way. If you do that, then you're only going to help others, be kind to others. Whether they're in a position to help you or not, that's not the point. See, some, they only want to help those who are in a position to do something back for them. That's not the way it should be. Be kind and friendly and loving to others no matter what their position may be. Charles Kingsley said this. He said, if you wish to be miserable, think much about yourself. About what you want, about what you like, or what respect people ought to give you. Just think about yourself. Well, is that the generation we live in? A lot of people have eye problems. I, 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 me, 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 mine, mine, mine. What's in it for me is what most people think. Jesus says treat others the way we want them to treat us. However, the motive is not to get something back from them. It's just to treat them right because it's the right thing to do. It's what Jesus would do. Secondly, our treatment should not only involve unselfish actions, but they should include unconditional actions. Jesus not tell us to treat others the way they treat us. What we do unto others has nothing to do with what they're doing to us. We're not to put conditions upon our actions. Somebody said, forget what you have done for others, but never forget what others have done for you. That was a post by my wife this week. I, I read her post every once in a while. But that was good. I thought, well, I could use that. Forget what you have done for others, but never forget what others have done for you. That'll work, won't it? But people get crossways, and you got people that won't talk to one another. They say, well, they won't talk to me, so I'm not going to talk to them. Know what we are to do 
is treat others as Jesus would treat them. That's, that's been the whole theme of this sermon, hasn't it? The Sermon on the Mount. Let me refresh your memory. Go back to chapter 5. And notice what Jesus says in verses 41 through 46. Because all this is working together. Matthew 5, 41. Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou away. Ye have heard it been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For we love them which love us. What reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? There's been a theme through this whole sermon. is how to treat others and therefore fulfill the word of God. God, Christ has shown us how to do this. Treat others respectfully. Treat others with love and honesty and compassion. If we are good to people, they often will return that goodness back to us. Again, that principle, reaping what you sow. It plays into so much of our life. Remind you, Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Amen. And the third thought I want to share with you this morning is, I want you to note the treatment that is demanded here. He says, for this is the law and the prophets. In other words, this is a summary of the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets. This is how we are to fulfill the law and the prophets. It was the whole object and purpose of their writings. So first of all, it's commanded by the law. It's commanded by the law. It's a summary of the law of God. It's another way of saying, love thy neighbor as thyself. Right? Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love God foremost and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus took the Ten Commandments and condensed them to two great commandments. If you love God foremost, you're going to keep the first four commandments. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're going to keep the other six commandments. Right? Why does the law tell us not to covet our neighbor's goods? Why does it say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness? What is the spirit behind these commandments? It's love. If you love one another, you're not going to steal from them. You're not going to lie about them. You're not going to do them harm. You know, there's positive side to the Ten Commandments. We, we get the thou shalt nots. That really bothers people. But there's a positive side. Instead of coveting what somebody has, rejoice in what they have. Instead of stealing from him, give to him. Instead of taking his life, enrich his life. Right? Instead of lying about him, speak well of him. Folks, this is not a supplemental behavior. This is a fundamental behavior that should mark the children of God. Love thy neighbor. Let me test you on that. So you're, you're heading home. And from a distance, you can see a house is blazing on fire, a blazing inferno. As you get closer, you realize, that's on my block. And as you get closer, you see which house it is. You say, well, thank God this is my house burning, not a neighbor's. And if you love your neighbors yourself, or would you say, well, thank God it's my neighbor's house burning, not mine. Now, which would it be? Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not easy to do, is it? Matter of fact, it requires the presence of God through the Holy Spirit to help us do that. 
The only motive we need to treat others right is because God commanded us. Amen. You ought to wake up each morning and pray, God, use me to bless somebody today. I want to be a blessing. And we can do that. Speak to people, smile at people, be friendly, be helpful. Be genuinely interested in other people. Be generous with praise and cautious with criticism. Be considerate. You know, there's usually three sides to a controversy. Your side, the other fellow's side, and the right side. Amen. Folks, what counts most in life is how we treat others. You'll be rewarded in this life and in the life to come. Secondly, not only commanded by the law, but communicated by the prophets. The prophets had preached that we should treat others unselfishly, unconditionally. They not only preached it, but they practiced it. We should treat others right, regardless of how they treat us. Jesus was willing to die for those who nailed him to a cross. Right? He even prayed for them. That God would forgive them for what they had done. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Here's the mind of Christ that we're to cultivate in our life. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ was thinking of others, not himself. Think about Christ on the cross. Before he thought of his own needs, he thought of others. He thought about his mother, didn't he? He said, John, behold thy mother. He told John the apostle, I want you to take care of mama for me. He thought about his mother. Then he thought about the thief on the cross next to him. He said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He thought about the people that nailed him to the cross and he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. He thought about everybody else before he ever thought about himself. Only after all of that did he say, I thirst. Now he's thinking about himself. But first he thought of others. You see that? That's the mind of Christ. That we need to develop, that we need to cultivate in our own life. You say, Brother Wes, how in the world can we practice the golden rule? How in the world can we do this? Knowing our natural state, how selfish, how sinful we are. How can I be so patient, so forgiving, so kind, and so helpful? Now, we all agree that that's the way to live. Can you imagine living in a world where everybody lived by the golden rule? Would this be a great place to live if everybody practiced that? But we know it's not going to happen. Especially those who do not know God as their Savior. We expect people to be friendly. Make no attempt to be friendly toward them. We can be so critical. I said, Brother Wilson, it's hard to say amen to this sermon. Well, just say ouch. Ouch. Here's how it's possible to live this way. You've got to be born again. See, this requires a transformation. A new birth, a new heart. We'll never be right with one another until we're first right with God. It doesn't start with your neighbor, it starts with God. When you're right with God... Then you can start being right with your neighbor. Because your whole attitude will change. Your, how, your outlook will change after you've been born again. So, to be able to live this way, you're going to need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. You're going to need to be 
indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Because only He can cleanse your heart of selfishness and sinfulness. Only He can give you a servant's heart of love for others. Are you saved? We always want to come back to that question. Are you saved? Now, I said at the beginning, some try to use this as a text for salvation. That if I keep the golden rule, I'll go to heaven. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? This is not the way of salvation. The way to salvation is given in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, for by grace, that's by God's grace. Are you saved through faith? That's faith in Jesus Christ. That not of yourselves is the gift of God. Not of works. Not by the works of keeping the great commandment or the golden rule. Not of works. Because if it was works, we could boast about it. But it's, it is by works, it's by the works of Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, that was the work needed to save us from sins. 